Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our program this evening. As you know, the title of it is The Truth About Medical Marijuana. We're delighted that our program tonight is also co-sponsored by our friends at Harper's Magazine, the Drug Policy Alliance, and the Richard and Rhoda Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California in Berkeley. The Independent Institute regularly sponsors the Independent Policy Forum, a series of lectures, seminars, and debates held here in the San Francisco Bay Area. In all of our programs, we seek to get beyond the stereotypes of left and right and feature speakers who will present their own views that we all, so that we all have a better opportunity to make up our own minds. For those of you who are new to the Independent Institute, the Institute is a nonprofit public policy research organization. We sponsor and publish many books and other publications and conduct many conference and media programs like our program tonight. We also invite you to, to visit us at our website, which is at independent.org. You'll find further information about our many publications, including our journal, which is called The Independent Review. It's a quarterly journal, and there are copies out in the front if you like to pick up one or get an idea of what it's about. You're also welcome to receive our free weekly email newsletter, which is called The Lighthouse. The Lighthouse will keep you up to date on many policy issues, as well as advise you of upcoming institute events and other programs. And um, to do so, be sure to leave your contact information, including your email address, before you leave uh, after our program tonight. Our next event, I want to mention, is going to be held on November 13th. It will be held at the Independent Institute's Conference Center, which is located in Oakland, just off of Route 880 by the Oakland Airport. The topic will be the USA Patriot Act and the assault on civil liberties. The program is being organized by our Center on Peace and Liberty and will feature Margaret Russell, who is chairman of the ACLU of Northern California and professor of law at Santa, Santa Clara University, David Cole from Georgetown University Law Center, and best-selling author James Bovard. We hope that all of you will be able to join with us. Also, in the program, handout that hopefully everyone got. You'll find information about the Institute itself, and we hope that each of you will join as an Institute associate member and become more directly involved in the battle over issues such as what we'll be addressing this evening. To set the stage for tonight's discussion, I want to mention a few developments that are worth noting. Articles today in Reuters, the New York Daily News, and USA Today now corroborate a major new National Enquirer story that Rush Limbaugh, the influential talk show host and highly vocal supporter of the war on drugs, is under criminal investigation by the state attorney, the state attorney general of Florida for his buying and mega consuming of thousands of addictive painkillers from a black market drug ring over the past four years. <laughs> If true, how again do you spell hypocrisy? In 1996, California voters passed Proposition 215, allowing physicians to recommend marijuana for medical purposes. To date, as I understand, 10 states have enacted medical marijuana legislation that is actually being implemented. And a total of 36 states in the District of Columbia have formally recognized in various ways the value of medical marijuana. A year ago, the Ninth Circuit, U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that doctors have a constitutional right to discuss marijuana with their, parent, their patients. However, refusing to accept the will of the electorate, the federal government has been fighting back. Earlier this year, Oakland resident Ed Rosenthal was the central target of the federal government's campaign to destroy the legal medical marijuana in California. The case and subsequent verdict against Rosenthal was based on withholding key information from the jury, including the fact that Mr. Rosenthal had been deputized by the city of Oakland under California law, specifically to attend to the seriously ill. In the case, Mr. Rosenthal faced a sentence of 60 years in federal prison. However, facing subsequent public outrage about the case, including a public protest by the jury's 
themselves, the presiding judge handed down a sentence of only one day in jail and a nominal fine. But Ed Rosenthal remains a convicted felon who is currently seeking to have his sentence overturned in a state with three strikes and you're out. Interestingly enough, in the current recall election in California, all of the major candidates from across the political spectrum, including those that have dropped out, have endorsed the legality of medical marijuana, how times change. Clearly, this is a reflection of the fact that over 70% of the public supports medical marijuana. Not to be discouraged, however, the Department of Justice has since asked the US Supreme Court to allow it to punish medical doctors who recommend marijuana and the DEA continues to raid and close down clinics. Meanwhile, Congressman Barney Frank and Sam Farr have each submitted bills respectively to reduce the federal, classifi federal classification of marijuana, to decriminalize its medicinal use, and to allow defendants in federal cases to claim compliance with state laws. Unfortunately, neither bill probably has much chance yet of passage. There are many questions to ask about federal policies, state policies, who benefits, who loses. Is California leading the nation? What kind of views are actually being presented and based on what? And what about the lives of the people who are suffering from cancer, AIDS, MS, and many other serious ailments? What happens to them in the meantime? Our independent policy forum this evening assembles several of the foremost experts to discuss the past, present, and future of medical marijuana. So I'd like to introduce our speakers. Please hold your applause until I complete the introduction. Uh, first, to my left, your right, is Ed Rosenthal, the noted activist and best-selling author who's been a key pioneer, as you all know, of the movement for medical marijuana. In 30 years of study, writing, and activism, he's become a trusted expert on, on medical marijuana use and social policy. He's also co-author of the important book, which you're featuring this evening, called Why Marijuana Should Be Legal. And there are copies uh, on the front table. And he's written over a dozen other books on the subject. To his left, again, your right, is Donald Abrams. I'm sorry. Sorry, Ron, Ron McCoon. <laughs> Ron, Rob is Professor of Law and Public Policy at the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley, and co-author of the other book that we are featuring this evening called Drug War Heresies from Cambridge University Press. He was formerly a behavioral scientist at the Institute for Civil Justice and the Drug Policy Research Center at Rand Corporation. He's one of the world's foremost authorities on drug policy. To my right is Edwin Dobb. Ed is contributing editor to Harper's Magazine. His writings on civil liberties have been published in Harper's, Amnesty Now, and San Francisco Magazine. He was formerly senior editor of the Sciences. He writes for New York Times Magazine and is a visiting lecturer at the Graduate School of Journalism, also at UC Berkeley. Finally, I want to introduce to his right, your left again, Donald Abrams. Don is professor of clinical medicine at the University of California here in San Francisco and one of the leading researchers in the world on medical marijuana. He's also assistant director of the AIDS program at San Francisco General Hospital and since 1981 has been involved in several landmark, landmark studies on HIV and AIDS. He's conducted clinical trials of marijuana since 1997, including trials with grants from the National Institute of Health. So please join with me in welcoming our speakers. Before we begin, a couple of quick program matters um, I want to mention. After our discussion, we will have questions from the audience. And in the, the uh, program that each of you have, there should be a question card. Uh, please just jot down your question during the, the uh, presentations, and there'll be people circulating in the aisles to pick up the cards for the Q&A period. In addition, after the Q&A period, we will adjourn and uh, Mr. Rosenthal and Mr. McCoon will be available to autograph copies of their books in the front lobby where you registered. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce Ed Rosenthal. Thing. I, 
I'd like to thank the Independent Institute for uh, sponsoring this forum and creating it. And I, I think that this is pretty incredible. And especially you, David, and also Bill Sandover, who's here. Uh, they've just done so much work in, in getting this together. Uh, inspiring. And I'd like to thank everybody who's here, and in fact, the entire community, because the reason why I am here and can be here tonight is because I was only given a one-day sentence, and that is because of you. It wasn't because of the judge. It wasn't because of, you know, any of the legal things. It was because of the pressure that the community and the media placed on the court system. So I'd like to give you a hearty thanks for that. Now, this issue, the issue of medical marijuana, is of prime importance to perhaps 100,000 Californians who use marijuana in one way or another to, for their health, who have been given recommendations by doctors. And it may improve the quality of their life, it may maintain their health, or it may actually keep them alive. And so this is not uh, just a, uh, a ruse issue or something like that. And uh, uh, this, this issue not only affects Californians, but also throughout the nation. And there are probably somewhere between half a million and a million people who use marijuana at, medically, whether or not they have a recommendation for it. Now, I, I'd like to go in, uh, into a little bit about my case. As you know, I was convicted on three counts, and that is cultivating marijuana, maintaining a place where marijuana is cultivated, and also a uh, conspiracy to cultivate marijuana. And as you know, this was a result of a jury that was kept ignorant of the facts of the case, that I was deputized uh, by the city of Oakland, that I was providing medical marijuana, that, uh, that this whole, that I was told by the city that I was immune from prosecution. And um, uh, once a jury found this out, when they went home and read the newspapers that they hadn't been reading while they were jurors, within hours they got back to the media and repudiated their sentence. And of course that had, did not have a uh, judicial meaning, but it certainly had a meaning to the media and it certainly had a meaning to the public. Because, you know, this case was not fought just on one level. It was fought on two levels. And that is, it was fought in the court, and it, so far we're losing the court case, but in the, but in the court of public opinion, we're the winners. And I want to mention something. You know, most of us, you know, when we vote, we realize we're minority voters in one way or another. We vote for all these candidates that don't win quite a bit of the time. And we vote for causes that seem to be lost causes. But we're the majority. When it comes to medical marijuana, we are the majority. Anybody who's opposed to it, they're in the minority. It's, it's a very unusual position to be in, at least for me. <laughs> and for most of us, I think. But we have to realize that, that we're not talking, we're not trying to convince people that medical marijuana is efficacious or that, it's, that, that, it, that it works or that it should be legal. We're just trying to convince a few politicians of it who are being wagged by the tail and I'll get into that. Uh, actually, eight of the jurors repudiated the verdict, two, two of the alternates. This had never happened before in American history. Now, I notice that it, it, it's heating up because the jury in the Oakland case, six members of the jury in the Oakland case, complained that, uh, that I'm talking about the uh, Riders case, have just complained about the, uh, what happened in their jury. So four days after the, four days after the jury convicted me, uh, they were back in the courtroom in, in the audience section for the judge to look at while he was deciding whether I was going to be remanded into custody immediately. Now, I know that most of you were very relieved that I was uh, uh, given only a one-day sentence six months later. Uh, but I, I was more ambivalent about it because, well, you know, it's pretty good getting a one-day sentence. And actually, the government owes me 12 hours because I served 36 hours. But uh, let's say they had given me five years and remanded me to prison right then and there. 
you know, it would have been a lot more headlines. Uh, I would have had a book sold by now on this. <laughs> and uh, I think it would have moved the laws. And I think that the government and the judge realized that if he had done that, that it would have caused uh, quite a bit more, con I'm going to just use the word controversy. Um, right now, the government is appealing my sentence. And uh, they want me to do the 21 months or five years or whatever. And I'm appealing the conviction both on technical and on constitutional grounds. And I, I wanted to go through them because they're, they're of importance. And uh, the first is um, that the judge, in pretrial, the judge was looking at the search warrant. And he realized that the uh, D DEA agent, Pickett, had lied on on the search warrant. So uh, instead of allowing a withering cross-examination, he said, well, I'm just going to excise certain parts of the search warrant. And what was left after he excised everything was that I had a high electric bill. And then my, then my attorney said, well, let's compare it with other electric bills in the area. And the judge said, I'm not going to allow it because there are industrial users in the area and then the search warrant what might not be good. So we're appealing on that basis. Then we're appealing because the judge found that the prosecutor had actually lied to the grand jury. And the judge found that he had misled the grand jury. But the judge said that no harm was done. And uh, I don't know, if we had lied, if some one of you had lied to the grand jury, you, you would be up for perjury. And here, the prosecutor is lying to the grand jury. And uh, he shouldn't have even been testifying. So those are the two technical grounds that we're appealing on. And we may very well win on those grounds. If we win, for instance, on the first one, it would mean that the way that search warrants are uh, looked at would, would change. It would change, uh, it would have court precedent there. But there are other more important uh, issues that we're covering. And I'm going to go through, uh, through these very quickly. The first is the Ninth Amendment. Now, you know, the Ninth Amendment has never been used in, in court work, or, or, or it's been used very little. Even the, uh, the Griswold decision, which was for birth control and the abortion decisions, did not rely on the Ninth Amendment. And what the Ninth Amendment says is that those rights of the people that, that are not enumerated in the Constitution remain with the people and shall not be denigrated. That means like, for instance, you have the right to eat strawberries. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that you have an inherent right to eat strawberries, but you have it because it's been there. Those are some of your natural rights. And there are two natural rights that, uh, that the Ninth Amendment covers in this case. And the, fir the first is that you have a right to seek health. Everybody has a right to seek health in their own way, whether you want to use uh, herbal uh, supplements, or whether you want to use vitamins, or whether you want to use uh, religion and prayer for your health. You have a right to determine how you will gain your health. And so by restricting medical marijuana, the, the government is restricting your right to health. And th then the second th part is this. Before the Constitution, people in the United States had the right to use marijuana. And then, up until 1937, there were no federal laws against marijuana. So that was 150 years that people were using, approximately 150 years during the United States that people were using marijuana. Then in 1937, the government realized that in order to restrict marijuana, it would have to pass a constitutional amendment. So instead, they passed a tax law that was confiscatory. It was a $100 an ounce tax, which in 1937 was a lot since an ounce only cost a couple of dollars. So uh, people would be arrested not for possessing marijuana, but for not possessing the tax stamp or, or paying the taxes on, on the substance. And it wasn't until 1968 that marijuana was made illegal. I believe that that's unconstitutional. People had the right to use marijuana through that entire period of time, and it was only in 1968 that it was made illegal. Well, if people had the right to use it, then that was a constitutional right. How can that be denied? And uh, this, you know, I, years ago, I wrote a paper that said that the Ninth Amendment is probably going to be the amendment of the 21st century, and I hope this is the first case on it. 
Then the then the Tenth Amendment, that's our state's rights amendment, that any uh, rights not given to the federal government remain with the states. And the, the, uh, the state has two basic rights, one uh, in this area. One is to regulate the health of its citizens, and the other is to regulate doctors. So the federal government is violating these rights uh, in, terms of the tenth, in terms of the Tenth Amendment. And uh, where this comes in, especially in, in my particular case, is in the Constitution, and these are interwoven, but in the Commerce Clause of the Constitution that regulates interstate commerce. Well, look, this marijuana was grown in California by Californians, for Californians. It was recommended by a California doctors for people to use in California. I fail to see where there's any interstate commerce. So if there's no interstate commerce and the state has the right to regulate health and it's already determined that marijuana is good medicine, then why is the federal government in here at all? And then uh, another issue is uh, 885D. And 885, 885D says uh, that it's a federal law and it's part of the Controlled Substances Act. And it says that if you're a federal, state, or city health or safety officer, and you're uh, in the course of your business, you're dealing with controlled substances, you're immune from prosecution. Well, that's so that narcs can buy and sell pot and other drugs and not get arrested for it. And I was a health and safety officer uh, that the city of Oakland had appointed. And I was told by the city uh, attorney's office that I was immune from prosecution under this law. So that, uh, the, and uh, uh, Judge Breyer said that a literal reading of this would seem to immunize Rosenthal from prosecution. But then he said, I'm not going to allow that. And then he didn't allow the jury to hear it. <laughs> and then there's the other thing. Let's say, let's say the city attorney was wrong. Let's say she was t the, the city attorney's office was totally wrong, and they had told me that I was immune from prosecution, but I wasn't. Well, then I should have been immune from prosecution because of estoppel, which means that if you're told that, you, that something that you're doing is okay by the federal government, they can't then come in and say, uh, uh, look, it, it, is, you're not, it isn't right, you're breaking the law, and you're under arrest. And that's a, the idea of estoppel. So I was, needless to say, I was a little surprised when I was arrested. And as you know, I never felt guilty. I, I'll, I'll tell you why I did this. You know, first of all, I'm a successful writer, which is pretty unusual in America. And I own my own publishing company. And so I do, I'm a middle, upper middle class or a middle class person. And I did not have to get involved in this. This was not my source of income. And the reason why I got involved in it was because the city of Oakland asked me to help patients. And, you know, there are all kinds of sins in life. And we read about most of them that come out of the Ten Commandments in the daily papers, you know, based on lust, greed, robbery, lying, th just basically the administration. Uh, <laughs> basic. So, so, so you look at that, but so, uh, but then there's, there are other sins too, and uh, sort of sins of omission. What, when you see somebody who needs help and you say, I'm not going to render that person help, that's a sin. That's a sin as much as lusting after somebody else's wife or husband or whatever. So, so I felt, you know, I was living with this, and then when the city said, well, you have immunity, well, I had no excuse not to do it. And then there were personal things like, Let's see, give, I can legally grow pot. Just the thought of that. <laughs> you know, I should say that, you know, they say that the federal government says that pot's addictive. Well, I, I don't think that marijuana is really addictive, but growing it is. <laughs> and, and so when I was given the opportunity to legally grow marijuana, I, I jumped at that. So anyway, um, so given that, 
it was, given all these circumstances, it was inevitable that when I was arrested that I would be fighting, would be fighting this. And uh, I had just read a book uh, a few months before I was arrested called The Tipping Point, which talks about movements and how movements form and how little things make big changes in society. And it, I, I think I was really fortunate in reading this book because it gave me insight into what was going to happen to me, what was happening to me, and what was going to happen to this issue. And after all of this, you know, the one thing that this did was change the paradigm in the way that people think about marijuana and that the way the press reports it. And this is exactly what the federal government was afraid of. This is what they've been trying to stop. And their doing this actually made me into a much better activist than I've ever been. You know, one of my, the, my ironic thoughts uh, is that for 35 years I was trying to think, well, what would make me a more effective activist? How can I be a more effective activist? How can I get this into the media so I could be speaking at places like the Independent Institute instead of at mass rallies and things? So, and uh, the federal government found it out for me. And, you know, so th let this be a warning. You better be careful what you wish for. <laughs> so, now, the, the real question is, why does the federal government want to do this? What's, what's their, what do they have in it? What, what's their vested interest in this? And I, ha I want to go into my, I have two ideas about this. The first is that they really hate marijuana more than any other drug, more, whether it's legal or illegal. And the reason for that, whether you're talking about tobacco, alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine, heroin, all of those drugs ultimately make you dysfunctional in one way or another, or can kill you, you know. And the problem with marijuana, as far as the police are, are concerned, is that there is no uh, payback to the people. They, they don't get any dysfunction from it. They might be happier than the police are. The, <laughs> it doesn't fit the Puritan ethic that if you have enjoyment, that in some way you have to pay for it. And I think, in a way, that's the psychology of the police. But there's something much more important, that the whole criminal justice industry is based on, uh, on on arrests and on catching criminals. And so if you decriminalized or regulated marijuana, then 8% of their budget would be down the drain. 8% of their budget, one out of every 12 arrests, one out of every 12 uh, jails, one out of every 12 cop cars, one out of every 12 judges. One, you know, it goes on and on down the line so that, uh, we're talking about a tremendous amount of money. And the marijuana war, war costs the federal government and you, the federal government and the state governments, that means us, really, somewhere between 15 and $30 billion a year. And we, I'll give you some quick statistics on that. There are 750, about 730,000 people who were arrested for marijuana last year, 88% of them for simple possession. There are probably between 100 and 150,000 people in prison right now for marijuana. There are 20,000 people in federal prison for marijuana right now. It costs the government $1.5 billion just to house that small town of 20,000 people. Half of those people are Hispanic, so that there are 10,000 Hispanic people in prison, in federal prison, just for marijuana. And, uh, you know, the, so if you can think of, uh, uh, how much resources is spent on that, it's incredible. So, so let's, let's give a hypothetical. Let's say tomorrow everybody stopped using illegal drugs, or let's say they just stopped using marijuana. Everybody stopped using marijuana. So the police went out to arrest people, there was nobody to arrest. Nobody was selling marijuana on the street, nobody was using it in their homes, it wasn't being used. It would be disaster for the DEA. Could you imagine that? Now look, DEA has had a pretty good growth period over the last 65 years. 
1937, when the tax stamp came in, there were estimated to be 55,000 users. Now there are, now there was, last year there were 730,000 arrests. That's about 13, there were, 13, there were the arrests totaled 13 times the, the number of users when marijuana was originally regulated. There are 25 million users for them, for the feds and state authorities to poach upon. It, they've had a tremendous success. You know, I, if you take a look at these statistics, uh, uh, statistical impossibility is going to happen sometime around 2020, where there'll actually be more marijuana users in the United States than there are people. <laughs> So, uh, let's see. Now, I wanted to get into, uh, I wanted to step back for a moment from this and get into what this is all about. And, you know, let's say we were talking about a river and uh, how this, how we were going to use this river. And, you know, there'd be all the stakeholders in this river and the water that this river provided would, would get together and talk about it. You know, you might have farmers and urban people and urban communities and environmentalists and maybe uh, there would be uh, fishermen might get involved in it. And together they'd reach some sort of compromise that probably nobody would like but that everybody could live with or sort of live with. But. So let's look at the stakeholders in terms of medical marijuana. Well, you have patients, you have the doctors, you have the providers, you have caregivers, you have manufacturers, and all of these people have something to lend to the discussion. You have the public health service, they might have something to say about it. All insurers might have something to say about it because they might have to pay for it. But where are the police in this? Where's the criminal justice system in this? What's their stake in this? They claim to have a stake in that. It's, what do they have a right to poach upon people, to poach upon sick people? Just what is their stake in it? And this is the problem. Their stake in this is arrests. They need arrests or else they can't justify their budgets. And that's what this whole thing is all about. And that's why this is a, we, we will hear later that this is a culture war, and this is part of the culture war, whether they have a right to arrest a certain group of people because, they, because they're using this substance just so that they can arrest them. Can you imagine all of the wasted resources of this? The thousands and thousands of people whose lives are being ruined. 750,000 people were arrested, 730,000 people were arrested last year. That doesn't affect just 730,000 people. It affects millions of people. It affects their families. It affects their employers. It, it, they, it might affect their employees. It affects, it, it affects them if they're college students because they lose all federal ability for federal grants. So uh, the, that 730,000 arrests, and it doesn't stop at the end of the year. Okay, this 30, 730,000 730, is processed, we'll do the next. It continues all their lives. They might lose professional licenses. They might lose the ability to continue with their education. So when we step, step back and we see who are the stakeholders, here's what I think. The police, the criminal justice system is not a stakeholder in whether medical marijuana patients should be able to use marijuana or how much they should be able to use, or how they should be able to grow it. They have absolutely no expertise in these, this area. Any expertise that they claim to have is negated by their official organization. And their official organization is the California Narcotics <coughs> Officers Association. You can go onto the internet and look at their position papers. And here's what they say. Marijuana is not a medicine. These people are verbal terrorists. Now, the reason why I say they're verbal terrorists, in order to remain a police officer in California, you have to 
continually get education. You have to take educational classes. And the California Narcotics Officers Association is deputized to give some of these classes. So what this is what they're teaching their uh, students, which is police, that, cal that marijuana isn't a medicine, that anybody who's using it is using it as a ruse. Don't believe it. Bust them now and let the court sort it out. And uh, they're giving a training session in case anybody uh, on November 8th through 13th. I'm going to try and register for it. <laughs> And uh, so uh, the, the, the say in this, they say that, uh, that uh, the people who are supporting medical marijuana are just doing it as a means of uh, pushing marijuana onto the public, you know, so that this is the first step. This is the only thing that I agree with them about, that, that medical marijuana is only a first step because everybody has a right to use it, whether they're using it medically or recreationally or however they want to use it. And I, I know that uh, the, now people will say, now the, the Narcotics Officers Association will say, well, that's exactly what we said. But let's, let's get real. Does the federal government differentiate between medical marijuana and recreational marijuana? There's no differentiation in the law. And in fact, what do they tell the juries? No matter what the state law might be, the federal government doesn't recognize medical marijuana. So you have this uh, Narcotics Officers Association functioning as verbal terrorists in this war. And then they want to sit down at the t table with stakeholders and say, well, we're stakeholders in it too. But I question, where is their stake in it? And I'll give you one example of how this played out very recently. There was recently the baskin Sellis bill, which uh, former Governor Davis is going to decide whether he's going to sign or not. Part of the reason he's former go going to be former Governor Davis is because he was always apathetic and, and actually anti-marijuana and anti-medical marijuana. And maybe if he had a little more empathy for a few sick people, he wouldn't be in the terrible position that he's in. But Okay, uh, so anyway, this Vasconcellos bill, what this bill originally said, it, it adopted the SAM, uh, the Sonoma guidelines, which were 99 plants and 100 or 200 square feet. Well, after it was ready to go right into the Senate, uh, what happened was uh, uh, Lochter got a hold of Vasconcellos and they changed it to six plants. Now, what, what expertise does, does Lochter have about what six plants will produce? What, what does he know about medicine? Why was he even involved in it? Don't you think it's up for the people of this state to make policy and then for the, the attorney general and the district attorneys to follow that policy and for the police to follow it rather than for the tail to wag the dog? That's where, that's where it's at. We have a police department that is out of control. And I'll, I, I have to get off, but there's one last part of this, which is if you look at the Oakland Narcotics Bureau, where do you think they're housed? They're not in the Oakland Police Building. They're not at City Hall. They're not in any of their own building, no. They have a space in the federal building. And narcotics divisions all over the country are becoming part of the national police. They're being directed more by the federal government by their than by their local police chiefs. And they are now becoming part of the, the anti-terror network. And that's what we're dealing with. Uh, we have a big job ahead of us, but we will win this. Here's something for us all to say and think about. These laws are doomed. Thank you. One thing I might just add as a footnote to what 
Ed's been saying is there's a school of economics that we use it in part at the Independent Institute called the School of Public Choice. And public choice economists are very well aware of what Ed is talking about as far as the um, incentives that police agencies have in fostering and actually criminalizing behavior for their own benefit. Um, I want to thank Ed uh, for a wonderful presentation. Our next speaker is Donald Abrams. <clears throat> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about how I got into this field of doing research on marijuana. It's been a path that's uh, been ongoing for the past 11 years. It started in 1992. I am an AIDS doctor, as was mentioned. I'm also newly appointed the chief of hematology oncology at San Francisco General Hospital. So I take care of patients with cancer and patients with AIDS, and that's what I've been doing during my career. In 1992, the AIDS conference uh, was being held in all places uh, in Amsterdam, and I was uh, in my hotel room, some of you understand that, yes, uh, <laughs> glancing at uh, CNN uh, when I noticed uh, Mary Rathbun was being arrested. Mary uh, was a volunteer in our clinic at San Francisco General Hospital. She was about 70. She was known as Brownie Mary. Uh, she won the Volunteer of the Year Award two years running because she came and took our patients to x-ray and took their blood to the lab and picked up their prescriptions. And she also baked brownies for her kids. And here I was in Amsterdam watching Brownie Mary being arrested in Sonoma for baking her brownies. When I got back home, there was a letter addressed to the director of research at the AIDS program at San Francisco General Hospital. Somebody brought it to me, thinking I was a good enough person to respond to it. And it was from Rick Doblin, who's the president of the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS. Rick is a graduate of the a PhD uh, graduate of the Harvard School of Government, and his particular interest is in drug policy reform. And Rick suggested that a clinical trial demonstrating the medicinal benefit of marijuana should come from Brownie Mary's institution, as if she were our dean or something. <laughs> Well, 1992 was a bad year for people living with HIV because we really had no drugs. We only had three, and I had just finished a trial comparing the three of them. So as a clinical trialist, this was sort of a gauntlet that I decided should be picked up. So I began to develop a clinical trial to look at smoked marijuana in patients with the so-called AIDS wasting syndrome, a very common condition at the time where patients lost weight, became very skeletal, had diarrhea, no appetite. And marijuana is something that these patients were using to a large extent, obtaining it from Dennis Perone's Cannabis Club in downtown San Francisco before it was closed. So we designed a clinical trial, Rick Doblin and, and myself, and sent it off. It was really readily approved by the Food and Drug Administration, surprisingly. The University of California Institutional Review Board had four pages of issues that I addressed. Uh, ultimately, uh, it was, uh, the, the question became uh, obtaining marijuana for the study, and we needed to go to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, where Alan Leshner uh, was the director at that time. Uh, Alan and I have a correspondent that's on the World Wide Web. It gives me a number of Google hits. Uh, but uh, basically, he sent me back a letter after nine months having reviewed my proposal and said that he was sorry that he could not uh, provide us with the marijuana for this clinical trial because the study was not scientific. Here it had been approved by the FDA, by the University of California, and controlled substance studies in California also need to be approved by the, research, the California Research Advisory Panel, or CRAP. CRAP actually, because <laughs> I've told this story so much, CRAP has changed their name to the Research Advisory Panel of California, so I can't make that little joke. Anyway, it was a little bit upsetting to me that uh, Alan Leshner called our study unscientific when all these other bodies had approved it. Turned out later on, Alan and I became somewhat uh, friendly, and he explained to me that something I didn't realize. The National Institute on Drug Abuse has a mandate from Congress to study substances of abuse as substances of abuse and not to provide them to researchers who want to study these substances for potential medical benefit. As he said, Donald, we're the National Institute on drug abuse, not for drug abuse. 
So Alan Leshner before he left. Anyway, so ultimately, uh, in 1996, uh, HIV changed because protease inhibitor drugs became available that could really suppress the virus. The wasting syndrome disappeared. This was the year that we in California voted for Proposition 215. And if you recall, at the end of the year, uh, Barry McCaffrey, flanked by Donna Shalala and Janet Reno, got up there on December 30th, 1996, and said, no, 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 physicians in California and Arizona cannot talk to their patients about use of marijuana uh, because we will do all these terrible things to them. And that's when physicians finally began to mobilize. The National Institutes on Health got together. The Institute of Medicine began to investigate this. And everybody said, we need more research. Having already written two proposals, we were ready to write a third. And the availability of protease inhibitors gave us a new twist. Because these drugs are metabolized in the liver by the same system that metabolizes cannabis. So we proposed a clinical trial not to see if marijuana was effective in patients with the AIDS wasting, because AIDS wasting disappeared, but to see if it was safe for people on protease inhibitors to smoke marijuana, fearing that there may be some sort of a drug-drug interaction between cannabis and their drugs, or cannabis and their immune system, because there was all this concern about what effect marijuana has on the immune system. This was successful. And in 1997, we were awarded $1 million and 1,400 of the government's finest 3.95% THC-containing marijuana cigarettes. <laughs> we conducted a clinical trial from 1998 to 2000 in which we enrolled 67 patients and housed them in our inpatient general clinical research center at San Francisco General Hospital for 25 days. One third of the patients took Marinol which is synthetic Delta-9 THC. One third took Marinol placebo, and one third smoked a NIDA cigarette three times a day for 21 days. Again, the end point of the study was what happens to the level of the AIDS virus in the bloodstream, with also a look at the immune system, the level of the protease inhibitors, and since we had the patients there, we were also gonna see what happened to their caloric intake, their weight, and their body composition. We completed the study, it, the study was published, I'm happy to say, August 18th of 2003, after having been rejected by four major August journals. Uh, it was rejected in the Annals of Internal Medicine, who had, it was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, who had previously rejected it, but I appealed it because I said they had published the results of my study in a thought piece on medical marijuana the year before, and I said, here I'm sending you the original research, I think you should publish it, and after a year, going back and forth about the statistics, they ultimately published the study. I will say that the first August journal that rejected it, named after uh, a region of our country in the Northeast, uh, <laughs> one of the reviewers, the peer reviewers, said that they felt that in one paragraph rejection said that these authors sound more like activists than scientists. I was a bit shocked, and I, I've been rejected by that journal on a number of times, and I said, you know, this is a bit biased, and I would be, if I were you, ashamed to have sent this to an investigator, uh, a letter that's so politically biased and rejecting this paper on the basis of that. The reviewer's comments, when, when a paper goes out for peer review, uh, peers review it and send back the comments, and the reviewer's comments in all the journals that rejected the paper were quite favorable. I think it was the editors of these journals that were concerned about publishing a study that showed our results. Our results being that there was no impact on the HIV viral load, that there was no significant drug-drug interaction between cannabis and the protease inhibitors, that the patient smoking marijuana gained weight, three kilograms uh, compared to one kilogram in the placebo group, and that in fact the immune system seemed to get a little better in the people smoking compared to the people on placebo. So anyway, the study's done, it's history, and fortunately for all of us, we live in the state of California, although who knows what's gonna happen next week, but <laughs> although we've heard uh, Governor Davis sort of lambast it, he did uh, approve or, or not veto uh, John Vasconcellos's subsequent bill which uh, provided money to establish the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research at the University of California. I have now been awarded three uh, grants to study three different conditions uh, in clinical trials. 
Currently, we are doing a study in patients with HIV and painful peripheral neuropathy, which is nerve damage, leading to very severe pain in the hands and feet. The patients with peripheral neuropathy do not benefit from opioids, but they do seem to benefit from cannabinoids or cannabis. So we have just completed a pilot study, and now we're doing a randomized placebo-controlled trial of smoked marijuana versus smoked placebo. We also have a study for cancer patients who are taking opioid narcotics and still have pain. This study is looking at the interaction of cannabis and uh, the opioid analgesics to see if together they provide an additive pain relief, which we believe they will. We're finally currently doing a study in women with breast cancer who have delayed nausea and vomiting secondary to their chemotherapy to see if cannabis or Marinol uh, provides relief. And the final study that I just hung up from the FDA with this afternoon discussing is a study to look at the volcano vaporizer as a smokeless delivery system. I believe personally that marijuana has medicinal benefit. This is not news. People have known this for 5,000 years. In fact, it is only over the last 70 years that physicians in this country could not prescribe cannabis. What I find myself in the midst of now is a somewhat Sisyphusian, if that's the right word, effort to reprove that marijuana is medicine. And we live in an era of evidence-based medicine, so my goal is to produce evidence that will hopefully convince people that need to be convinced that this is a drug that benefits people who need it. Whether or not this is a possibility in our lifetimes remains unclear, but it is the goal of the work that I'm doing. With that, I'll stop, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Donald. Our next speaker is Edwin Dobb. Thank you, David. I speak not as a medical expert or criminologist, but instead as a, a person whose occupation, journalism, forces him to pay attention to certain perennial questions uh, regarding democratic citizenship. One question concerns how societal problems are identified and defined. Another concerns the people controlling the process of definition. In other words, who determines the way problems are framed, the terms that, dom that dominate public debate, the often hidden or deliberately obscured assumptions that steer and constrain solutions. The two questions are, of course, intertwined and taken together they constitute an inquiry into the exercise of power. Just such an inquiry is needed, I believe, to expose what may be missing or underappreciated in our approach to the use of such illegal mind-altering substances as marijuana. Judging from the language, stories, and images that dominate mainstream media, the troubles that accompany drug use can be understood in two general ways. On the one hand is the medical perspective, with its emphasis on illness, treatment, and physicians. On the other is the punitive perspective, which stresses moral weakness, punishment, the police. Note that both models are based on roughly the same assumption, that the problem springs from some form of individual inadequacy. Certainly those who actually provide the treatment or mete out the punishment may and often do hold a more complex, less exclusive view of the people in their charge, especially of the reasons why human beings make a habit of ingesting mind-altering substances. But I'm speaking here of the debate as it plays out in the public domain, the fundamental terms that define how we as a society frame the issue before us. Essentially, that's a bipolar world inhabited by sick people and bad people. It's also a relatively new world brought into existence in 1914 with the passage of the Harrison Narc Narcotic Act which for the first time in this country made the use of some mind-altering substances a crime. During the past 90 years, the pendulum has swung between punishment and treatment, with punishment clearly being the preferred alternative, the one to which we devoted by far the most time and resources. Indeed, among the early consequences of the Harrison Act was the arrest of physicians who refused to stop prescribing drugs how and when they saw fit. 
as if there weren't enough about this wrong-headed, profoundly destructive social experiment to induce despair, consider that we are once again harassing, arresting, and incarcerating physicians. Physicians who, employing not only marijuana but powerful opiates, would dare to relieve patients of excruciating, often end-of-life pain. Perhaps nothing so clearly exemplifies the worldview of those prosecuting the war on drugs than the demonization of doctors. As in the war on terrorism, the rhetoric has become wildly inflated and misleading, allowing for the exploitation of fear and ignorance and the cynical promotion of self-serving rationales for curtailing the private behavior of our neighbors. In such a politically as well as emotionally charged climate, we must choose our words carefully. For at least a generation, and under both Democratic and Republican administrations, the threat to society posed by the use of illegal substances has been deemed so grave that, that the only reasonable solution is one that's described in military terms. The policeman is now a warrior, and the warrior can't do his jobs if his hands are tied. Ridding the world of evil is a dirty business. Blood we, will be spilled. Collateral damage can't be avoided. And it's not enough. Really, it's never been enough to counter this view with one that simply replaces warriors with healers. By allowing ourselves to be seduced by the traditional bipolar scheme, and with few exceptions, the mainstream media will, still encourages this outlook, we inadvertently ignore a more fundamental issue, rights and responsibilities in a democratic society. By insisting that the only alternative to the rhetoric of punishment is the rhetoric of treatment, we make it easier for those who believe that the war on drugs justifies placing new restrictions on the freedom of individuals. But if instead we move the discussion into a civil liberties context, the considerable and ever-growing dangers of the war itself come into focus, and the strategy of the warriors is exposed for what it is in effect, if not intention, an assault on the principles upon which the Constitution is based. At the most fundamental level, the issue isn't one of sickness versus health, or bad versus good, it's what lengths do we believe the state can and should go to to monitor and control the voluntary private use of any substance, regardless of its effects upon the individual. Seen in this light, the societal problem that truly demands our attention isn't drug abuse, it's the abuse of power. Preventing the government from overstepping its bounds is probably the quintessential and enduring topic, topic of debate in, a robust, in robust democratic societies. So it's no surprise that the terms were set long ago, and in this regard, never so forcefully as in John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty, written in 1857. Since this goes to the heart of the matter, it deserves being quoted at length. Here's what Mill wrote. The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. He cannot rightfully be compelled to do so or forbear because it will be better for him to do so, because it will make him happier, because in the opinion of others to do so would be wise or even right. The implications couldn't be clearer. The state shouldn't use its police powers to punish adults for what they ingest, period. Nor, and this needs to be emphasized, should the state compel treatment. Over himself, Mill says, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. And with such sovereignty, we must remind ourselves, comes responsibility, should one person's exercise of rights lead to excess and bring harm to another. To favor legalization is not to favor a cruel free-for-all in which no one is held accountable for his actions. But once the principle of individual sovereignty is violated, all civil liberties are at risk, which is the same as saying that all citizens are at risk which is another way of saying that, is, that as remote as the use and sale of, of illegal substances, substances may seem to some, the war on drugs, like the war on terrorism, is our war, like it or not. It's being fought in our name, after all, and with our tax dollars. More to the point, a government that has no qualms about abridging the civil liberties of your pot smoking or cocaine snorting neighbor could just as easily show up your, on your doorstep with an equally unwarranted and intrusive plan to prevent you from harming yourself. Merely a partial list of the drug warriors' current assaults on liberty explains why former Supreme Court Justice Thurg Thurgood Marshall referred to them as the drug exception to the Constitution. 
Um, Ed mentioned some of these. I'm going to run through just a few just to give you a, a feel for, for uh, how many different ways uh, we're at risk. Here are 10 reasons why U.S. citizens should take exception to the drug exception. Restricting free speech. That's one of the primary reasons we're here this evening, of course. And I just want to note that, again, the hypocrisy, hypocrisy of those in power who profess a distaste for governmental intrusion yet are intolerant of states' decisions in this regard. Invasion of privacy. Drug testing is now so routine, routine, routine that we, 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 we scare, scarcely question it. But it has severe consequences, even though it's an unwarranted invasion of privacy. No necessary connection exists between urine analysis tests and impairment, and the test can be inaccurate. Imagine getting fired, for instance, for having had a drink the previous Friday night. That's, in effect, what's happening. Uh, the state is monitoring and punishing private behavior that's, that's unrelated to job performance. Violation of due process. Civil asset forfeiture, the seizure of cars, homes, and other property, has become one of the nasty little secrets of law enforcement agencies because they've grown dependent, as Ed has pointed out, grown dependent upon the proceeds generated. More alarming, though, is that despite recent reforms, property still can be seized before a person is convicted of a crime, the property needn't be involved in the facilitation of a criminal enterprise, and the burden of proof is less than that required in a criminal proceeding. Often the most serious offenders, those with a great deal of money, uh, can bargain for leniency, further corru corrupting the process. Cruel and unusual punishment. Beginning with the Sen Sentencing Reform Act of 1984, mandatory sentencing laws have greatly reduced the discretionary power of judges, leading to grossly disproportionate forms of punishment. Other disparities include those introdu introduced under the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of the late 1980s. For example, um, the most egregious example, the difference in um, punishment for uh, different amounts of powder cocaine and crack co cocaine, 500 grams in the case of powder, five in the case of crack, with uh, the same uh, sentencing. This obviously discriminates against poor and minorities, as most of these do. Denying access to education. In 1980, 1998, a federal law was passed banning federal aid to students who've been convicted of drug crimes. Incredibly, convicted murderers and rapists are eligible for financial aid, while those convicted of marijuana or other drug charges are barred from a year to life. In the last three years alone, about 90,000 people have been denied aid. The law obviously discriminates against the poor, those most in need of education. Homelessness. In 1996, the Department of Housing and Urban Development enacted a one-strike-and-you're-out policy whereby a single drug crime on or off housing premises can result in the eviction of an entire household. Not only does this provision deny people the right to, to due process, which prevents one person from being punished solely because of the actions of, others, of another, it targets low-income families, those for whom the prospect of hom homelessness obviously is most devastating and consequential. Disenfranch disenfranchisement. In 13 states, ex-felons are barred from voting for life. And in the war on drugs, as we know, thousands upon thousands of people are being convicted of felonies every year. Destruction of the social net. The Welfare Reform Act of 1996 denies for life cash assistance, food stamps, and other benefits to any person convicted of a state or federal drug offense. Now 19 states continue to impose the ban in full, while 31 have eliminated or modified it. Once again, even murderers and rapists escape such pu punitive measures. And once again, the law targets the poor, as well as children. According to a 2002 report by the Sentencing Project, more than 92,000 women and 135,000 children are affected by the welfare ban. Misuse of informants. Frequently, the only evidence against a defendant is the accusation of an informant. Under current rules, such informants can remain anonymous. And given the pressure on everyone involved to plea bargain, defendants often never get the opportunity to conf confront their accusers. A further abuse is the over-reliance on the testimony of a single biased witness. The recent case in Tulia, Texas, which most of you probably heard about, is an, an obviously an egregious example. 12% of the black population of a town of about 5,000 people were arrested solely on the word of a corrupt undercover agent. But that was preceded in 2000 by the arrest of 15% of the black males in the town of Hearn, Texas, this time on the word of an informant who'd agreed to implicate certain individuals, all the men were innocent. Nightfall 
as former Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas once said, does not come at once, neither does oppression. In both instances, there is a twilight when everything remains seemingly unchanged. And it, and it is in such twilight that we all must be aware of change in the air, however slight, lest we become unwitting victims of the darkness. Changes in the air brought about by the war on drugs are now so numerous and troublesome that they cannot be ignored without risking deep and possibly permanent damage to the republic. It is a dark, it is dusk, and vigilant is vigilance is required to navigate in the, in the fading light. This is the responsibility not of experts in law or medicine or sociology, though their skill and wise counsel are surely needed, but instead all citizens. Nor should it be left to the drug warriors who, even as we sit here tonight, are laying plans to conflate the war on drugs and the war on terrorism, concocting something called the Victory Act, which could greatly expand the government's power to seize records and, and conduct wiretaps, make it easier to seize property, and so on. The so-called drug problem, redefined as an abuse of power problem, dictates a very different set of solutions than those that usually dominate such discussions. And they all stem from an awareness of and willingness to fight to maintain the real locus of power in a democracy, the people. The warriors can pursue their ill-conceived war only as long as we permit them to do so, only as long as we defer to their mad vision, only as long as we view ourselves as spectators, unwitting victims, in the words of Douglas. Civil liberties cannot exist in the absence of citizens who, on the one hand, exercise them, and the, on the other, defend them. In the defense of liberty, no one should be arrested, charged, go to jail, or in any way suffer coercion at the hands of the state for possessing or using drugs of any kind. Besides protecting individual rights, this approach would greatly reduce corruption of law enforcement agencies and help restore the integrity of the overall judicial system. Thank you, Ed. Uh, for those of you who have not followed it that closely, of course, the USA Patriot Act has a uh, successor, which was termed Patriot II, and of course, the Patriot Act was cynically named Patriot Act to um, uh, appeal to the public. And when the Patriot Act began to get bad PR, of course, they changed or renamed the Patriot Act II to the so-called Victory Act. So that's the next thing on the horizon. Um, our next speaker uh, is Robert McCoon. Thanks, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I think the, the civil liberties issues are, are quite important, but I'm gonna change direction a little bit and focus more on some empirical questions about the effects of drug laws on, on drug use. Um, I'm actually going to say very little about medical marijuana because I actually don't think medical marijuana is um, really what's at issue here. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> the, the, the risk of uh, medical marijuana systems leaking marijuana into the recreational community is, is such a trivial problem that I, I, I find it extremely difficult to rationalize the federal government's interest in this. Uh, taken at face value. But I think clearly what the federal government's really interested in here is um, uh, symbolic politics, the symbolic politics of medical marijuana and um, the perception that medical marijuana is really a, a Trojan horse for um, marijuana legalization. And, and I think they're, they're surely right. I think it, it, it's clear that um, the medical marijuana issue um, carries tremendous political importance. If you, I've been tracking Gallup polls uh, op, measuring opposition to marijuana legalization and if you, if you look back over 30 years, the opposition has been very stable among adults at 75-80% of the population. Only recently have we seen that opposition really start dropping and I think the opposition is really start, starting to drop in part because um, the federal government has shown pretty much the same kind of uh, political acumen that the Fox News lawyers showed when they went after Al Franken, uh, which is um, 
Uh, the problem with going after medical marijuana is the issue is that medical marijuana really brings into focus um, public views about what we're actually achieving with marijuana prohibition. Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter, uh, when he was president, uh, amazingly, when he was president, said uh, penalties against a drug should not be more dangerous to an individual than the use of the drug itself, and when they are, they should be changed. Nowhere is this clearer than the laws against possession of marijuana. Um, so I want to open up the context a little bit by looking at, well, what, do we, what would actually happen if we decriminalize marijuana, depenalize marijuana, um, legalize marijuana? And um, I come at this not as an activist telling you what to believe, but as a, a, a policy analyst, uh, fund, definitely not funded by the federal government, but funded by the Alfred Sloan Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, to look at this question uh, empirically. And we, uh, uh, I've looked at this in ver various different angles, looking at historical evidence, cross-national comparisons, um, looking at experiences with alcohol and tobacco regulation, and so on. So I just want to tell you about some of the, some of the things we know, and we don't know everything we'd like to know, but um, we, uh, the, the federal government has been complaining about Canada's, Canada's recent decision to decriminalize marijuana and, and saying that they're bad neighbors, that they're poisoning our neighborhood. And, uh, the Canadians were uh, good enough neighbors in the 1970s not to accuse us of being bad neighbors when uh, 11 of our states decriminalized marijuana. In fact, we did it first. Uh, 11 states in the United States decriminalized marijuana, meaning specifically uh, possession uh, was downgraded from a felony to a misdemeanor. And it varies from state to state how this is implemented, whether there's a quantity limit or a frequency limit or so on. But um, and so that's one of the sources of evidence we can look at. And when we look at that evidence, uh, we are unable to find any effect of that legal change on levels of marijuana consumption. They're just, you can't really detect any. Um, there's one study um, that has um, shown a very small effect. Nobody else seems to get the effect. Even the study that finds an effect is very tiny. Um, Australia, several regions of Australia have uh, depenalized, I prefer the term depenalization because I think it's clearer, um, uh, have depenalized possession of marijuana. Both cross-sectional and longitudinal studies fail to find any effect of, of this on levels of marijuana use. Um, the U.S. is increasingly isolated in marijuana policy as country after country relaxes their marijuana laws. The, U the U.S. federal government has really been bullying other countries into trying to toe the U.S. party line for a long time, and a lot of countries are finally saying, no, uh, uh, we're going to go our own way. Canada has said that. Uh, Great Britain has said that. Uh, many regions of Germany have said that. Australia, uh, Portugal, uh, uh, Italy and Spain, it's actually not well known, but Italy and Spain have already uh, decriminalized uh, marijuana back in the 1970s. Um, and, uh, and we don't find effects of removing penalties for possession on use. And this is a big part of what this debate is about, and this looming specter of depenalization does, does not look like a very serious, um, like, like it has any serious consequences. I do want to talk about distinguishing depenalization from legalization and talk a little bit about legalization. Legalization would involve actually allowing um, legal sales of marijuana. And here we really only have one uh, contemporary example, and even that's not a perfect example. The Netherlands, um, on the, by the letter of the law, uh, cannabis, is pro cannabis sales are prohibited in the Netherlands. Um, uh, Don mentioned Amsterdam and people laughed. Um, the, a lot of my research has been in Amsterdam. It's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. Um, <laughs> and um, the, uh, uh, what the Dutch actually did was they have a written policy of non-enforcement of uh, sales of up to five grams of marijuana. Um, the, uh, the evidence on the effect of uh, commercial sales very ambiguous, and it's very hard to, to know for sure what's happening. I will say, during the 1980s, when there was a dramatic increase in the number of coffee shops and the visibility of coffee shops, and, and during a period in the 80s where there was a lot of advertising by these coffee shops, the Netherlands was the only country that had rising le levels of marijuana use. In Europe, 
um, the United States had falling levels during that time. I think it's not implausible that commercial promotion did lead to some increase in use. Having said that, it's very hard to, 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 to find any indication that that's in any way harmed Dutch society. And in fact, levels of marijuana use in the Netherlands are now um, significantly lower than in the United States. Um, uh, the, the Dutch, interestingly, the reason why they allow coffee shops to sell marijuana is that a sociologist in, in the 1970s, a Dutch sociologist, argued that there was a gateway effect, that marijuana led to hard drug use. And the Dutch concluded that they needed to soften their marijuana laws. How did they reach this conclusion? conclusion? Because they believe the, the causal mechanism of the gateway is that young people come into contact with hard drug users and hard drug dealers. And so they wanted to separate the markets. Uh, it seems to me if, and in fact, uh, in, in my book, I review some evidence that the Dutch have successfully done this and that they've actually weakened the gateway. Um, the, uh, it seems to me that probably a less risky way to um, reform marijuana laws, if, if you interpret increased use as a risk, and not everyone does, um, would be, uh, to uh, follow the model used in Alaska uh, and in South Australia, which is to allow legal cultivation of a uh, small number of plants for personal use. There's no commercial promotion involved. Um, there's no advertising involved. And it's, it separates the, the marijuana market from the hard drug market without um, the risk of commercial interest. And in our book, we, l we take a very jaundiced look at the tobacco industry, gambling industry, alcohol industry. And there are a lot of problems with moneyed interest getting involved in, uh, in intoxicating substance. Um, so when we look at the looming specter of, of you know, so what are the threats faced by uh, the slippery slope of medical marijuana, I, I don't think that the threats are really all that serious. And it's worth looking, looking at them directly. And I think what's happening is increasingly many countries are looking at the evidence and concluding that it's just very hard to, to justify an aggressive American-style um, war on marijuana. Thanks. And thank you, Rob, very much.